Ever had that sinking feeling when your photos don't quite measure up after a shoot? Well, you're definitely not alone. I've been there too. But fear not, because today I'm revealing seven essential techniques to guarantee that your next photo shoot will leave you feeling elated rather than disappointed. So because the conditions were forecast to be very dull today, especially this morning, I thought I'd come and check out a brand new area that I haven't checked out before. I've seen a couple of photos in some magazines uh, where people were co-steering, but I've not really been able to find any other information about it. So I thought I'd have a bit of a wander down the coastal path and see what I can find. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then we've got a great destination to go to for sunset where hopefully the conditions should be quite good. One of the challenges of exploring a new place for the first time is becoming overwhelmed by the beauty of the surroundings because it can prompt a real strong desire to want to capture absolutely everything. Unfortunately, this often leads to super boring photos that lack any kind of vibe, story or balance. What I mean is that an amazing location doesn't automatically translate into an awesome photograph. I think attempting to include too much in a single photo can sometimes confuse viewers, leaving them unsure of where to look. Now, my straightforward solution upon arriving at a new location is to take a minute or two just to assess what I truly want to capture, what interests me. And I look for focal points that could you know, serve as compelling subjects within the broader scene. And it's often more effective to construct an image by eliminating as many distractions as possible. For me at least, simplicity is often the key ingredient. Now, if visualising this seems challenging, a real helpful technique is to take a wide shot of the entire scene and then zoom into it on the preview on your camera. And this allows you to identify potential compositions within the larger frame. It's then just a case of choosing the right camera position and focal length to make that composition work. I do this all of the time and it seriously helps to nail down those difficult to compose shots. So I've been walking for a while now and I was thinking that I missed it, the place that I've kind of got in mind, but I think it's over there. Look, if I just point down there, you can just about see a rock slab. Well, just underneath that rock slab, there's a big stone arch. Now, I'm not sure whether <laughs> the tide's right at the minute to be able to see it. So let's uh, get around this corner and we'll take a closer look. So one thing I've noticed a lot, and I'm pretty sure I've been guilty of myself, is going overboard with sharpening an image. I think over-sharpened images often appear unappealing to me, and I think they're frequently the consequence of poor camera technique from the outset. So with my camera setup, I usually don't go crazy on the sharpening. Sometimes I'm actually toning down the sharpness just a little bit, especially for my woodland images. But this, of course, is going to vary from camera to camera. And I think the main reason some folks OD on sharpening is because their original shot was soft in the first place. And there are a bunch of reasons why that could happen. So here are a few examples. So firstly, the aperture. If the aperture is too wide, for instance, at say f5.6, the depth of field may be too narrow, resulting in parts of the image being unintentionally out of focus. Conversely, if the aperture is stopped down too much, say at f16 or f22, the image will have a larger depth of field, but it may become soft due to lens diffraction. So getting the balance right is key. Typically, I'm shooting between f8 and f13 for the majority of my landscape photos. Next is movement within the frame. So objects like grass, bushes or trees moving dur during the duration of the shot can lead to softness unless a fast enough shutter speed is used to freeze that motion. So it's always essential to assess the movement and check your images just by reviewing them on your camera. Next is camera shake, and similarly, if the camera is handheld or, and a slow shutter speed is used, it can introduce movement into the shot, resulting in a soft image. Usually I try to keep my shutter speed equal to my focal length, so if I'm shooting with a 35mm lens, then my shutter should be above 1 30th of a second. However, a lot of cameras now have IBIS, so that rule can be kind of adjusted to suit your camera. Next up is poor quality lenses. So cheap lenses are often not as sharp as their professional counterparts and may require more sharpening in post-production. Typically though, that softness will be around the edges of the frame. So if you're using a more cost-effective lens, shall we say, it may be worth applying more sharpening to the edges or corners than the rest of the frame. So 
A workaround could be to drop a radial filter over your image and apply some moderate sharpening to the corners first and then some overall sharpening to the whole of the image. That way the corners get a little bit more than the center, helping you not to over sharpen the center. Next, we have the dreaded focus mist. We've all been there, haven't we? So if your focus is not accurate, the resulting photo could be soft, especially when using a shallow depth of field to say isolate a subject. Say you're at f2.8, focus is very critical. So that's always something I'm looking out for. I'm always constantly reviewing my images, especially when using shallow depth of field. <laughs> so I'm perched right on the edge of this cliff here and it is a little bit on the uh, sketchy side to say the least. I don't think I'm going to venture down there today. These winds are too strong. It's a sheer drop down there but I have found the stone arch and I think this is a beach or a place where you need to come to at a low tide. I'm not going to attempt this uh, pretty treacherous pathway down here. But actually, this view here might make a really nice shot if the sun was coming in from that angle. So that might be something to look at on another occasion. But yeah, what an incredible spot. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, I'm going to get out of here. That place was pretty special, wasn't it? It looked great from the air, and I did manage to capture a few drone shots, so I'll put those up on the screen for you as I make my way back to the car to get to our next destination, which, fingers crossed, should be an absolute belter. fan of black tea. So making a photograph in the wrong light can absolutely ruin an image. So for instance, when we're dealing with harsh light in a woodland environment, it can prove really challenging, but it doesn't necessarily mean that taking photos in such conditions is impossible. Instead, I think it just means that we may need to shift our focus to maybe detailed shots or seek areas of adequate shade. Essentially, it's about aligning the subject with the available light as opposed to just trying to make do with the conditions that we, you know, we want to shoot for or the scene that we want to shoot. My least preferred lighting situation is when the light is directly behind me. I try to avoid it at every cost. But from a technical standpoint, I think shooting directly into the sun poses the most challenging lighting conditions. So I quite often try to compose my shots with the sun just outside the frame or when the intensity is diffused by clouds or mist. While images featuring the sun can be absolutely stunning, getting them right can be really intricate, often requiring extensive post-processing, especially when working with bracketed photos or dealing with lens flare. Now, personally, I find side lighting to be one of my favorites when capturing the wider scene, especially during moments when the sun is low, creating those long contrasty shadows. I absolutely love that. In the woodland, I think side light proves to be really effective when the light is soft or diffused, such as in misty conditions, because it can make those tree trunks look three dimensional as that soft light wraps around the branches. And that is something I'm always looking for when I'm in the woodland, but it's, those conditions are just so hard to find, aren't they? So one of the reasons I wanted to check out this beach here is because after heavy rain, there is a waterfall which pours down onto the sand and it creates some amazing sand patterns, or at least it did last time I came down here. So I really want to try and see if I can make an image or two. <laughs> but check out this house just here. It's absolutely insane. 
Just look at that. How cool is that? How would the other half live, eh? Reminds me of uh, Teletubbies. <laughs> uh, when my kids were little, they used to watch that program. It's just like that, isn't it? Anyway, let's get down to the beach. So moving on to point number four and another issue I'm sure I've been guilty of on more than one occasion is over editing an image. And I think the primary reason for this is often, you know, it stems from having you know, unfavorable conditions in the first place, you know, when we're in the field, you know, when the lighting is poor, we often find ourselves having to invest more effort in post-production compared to situations with optimal conditions. You know, personally, most of my favorite images are the ones that require minimal amounts of post-processing work. I think a common example of over-editing that I frequently come across is when photos of, say, expansive views like vistas are captured in very flat light. You know, many times excessive contrast is applied to compensate for those low levels of contrast present in the original shot. Now, while adding contrast works effectively when there are highlights and shadows in the scene, applying it to flat images can result in grungy, kind of over-processed looking shots which i'm not personally that keen on and it's why i tend to avoid shooting vistas in very flat conditions i found something here that is truly beautiful and uh yeah i've just uh, i've just been shooting this for the last 10 or 15 minutes as the light's changing because it's absolutely stunning so basically what i've done i've framed it up square i'm on the 7300 lens zoomed right in at 300 mil and right in the middle of the beach here between the camera and the cliff face is a white shell and it's absolutely beautiful. It's situated right in the middle of this water flow here. Now what's happening is the light's hitting the cliff face at the back there and reflecting some wonderful golden red light into this puddle here on the beach. And it looks stunning, it really does. As the light changes, the intensity of the color changes too. It's not simple to uh, get right because I'm at 300 mil there's a lot of problems that can be introduced in a shot like this. It's quite windy, so I'm having to keep my uh, shutter speed quite high. So at the minute I'm at 50th of a second and I've had to boost my ISO up to 400 to get that at F11. I need to be at F11 just because I want to make sure everything that's in front of the shell is sharp and behind it too. I don't want it to fall out of focus too much. Oh, here comes that light. That's just, uh, I've got my 10 second timer on as well. Any movement on the camera here is just gonna render this shot soft and unsharp, which obviously I don't want. So yeah, wow, the colors, just unbelievable. Like a, a really strong copper orange color. And then we've got this pristine white shell. Yeah, absolutely love this one. So let's talk about point number five, which is overly lifted shadows. So I think as photographers, we're constantly emphasizing the importance of light. I'll try to shield my microphone. But uh, I think shadows hold their own significance too. And personally, I prefer having pure black in my images rather than pure white and I often allow the deepest parts of my shadow areas to fall into complete darkness. Now, I get it, you know, this approach might not be to everybody's taste, but I found that it gives the image a more natural look compared to lifting the exposure of the shadows to make everything inside them crystal clear, you know. To me, I think overly lifted shadows doesn't feel that authentic, and it's another thing I make a conscious effort of to steer clear of. So let's go and see if we can find another shot, because I'm pretty sure there's another one just down here that I might set up for for sunset. So the light is absolutely beautiful right now, casting these amazing golden tones to this cliff face. And this cliff face looks like a giant wave sweeping over from the right hand side. All these amazing mineral flows going down the face of it too. It's amazing cloud detail as well, which is filling the scene. This is pretty interesting, I think. Quite unique, I think, this shot. Feels that way anyway. Yeah, stunning. Settings wise, tenth of a second, F10, ISO 125. I'm at about 18 mil, something like that, on the uh, 1655 lens. So yeah, absolutely wonderful. So 
Look, not adapting to the conditions can be challenging and it's something I've always struggled with. So quite often we go to a location, don't we, with a very specific idea in mind. You know, we've scouted it previously, chosen the perfect evening based on the weather forecast and we're all set for the shot. Well, quite often reality doesn't match our expectations, does it? And instead of scrapping the preconceived shot and searching for something else that fits the current conditions, we sometimes stick to that original plan and keep our fingers crossed, hoping that something amazing is going to happen. Now, occasionally it works out, doesn't it? But, you know, we, we might get lucky. But I think more often than not, the wiser choice might have been to explore an entirely different composition and save the original one for another day. Now, making that call is never going to be easy, though, is it? But I think it's something that becomes more manageable with experience. Now, I'd love to stand here and give you a foolproof method for making these decisions. But the only advice I can really offer is to be as reactive as possible. Don't get too focused on the shot you went out to capture and try to keep your eyes on what's behind you too, as sometimes that can be a better option. So number seven is getting caught up in the rules. Now, there are many rules in photography that are passed around that are designed to help compose your photos, such as the rule of thirds and leading lines, those type of things. And they're quite often a great way to start composing a photo. However, it's essential, I think, to bear in mind that adhering strictly to these rules can limit our creative flair a bit. And this is why I prefer to use the word guide as opposed to rule. I think if we use the rule of thirds as a guide, we can use it much more loosely. For example, the horizon might be better placed an inch below the top third as it helps to show some cloud detail that would have been cropped out if we followed the rules. So I think using them as a guide definitely is way more useful. The video up here will take you to another one all about composing your photos in unique ways, which is well worth a look if you haven't already seen it. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content because that really does help me out. And if you would like to support me further, then please do consider checking out my landscape photography zine, 30 Days Volume 1, which is linked up here somewhere. Anyway, guys, take care. I hope to see you all again next week.